Welcome to the EduData Podcast, a podcast that serves as your weekly guide to the data driving higher education. We are your hosts. I'm Jamie Boggs. And I'm Timothy Davis. Join us every Friday for weekly breakdowns of the most important data, trends, and topics in higher education. The EduData Podcast is a part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered, all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Edu Data Podcast. Jamie Boggs here with Timothy Davis. Timothy, how are you today? Doing well, doing well. Excited to be back for uh, another episode. Yeah, this topic seemed to get you pretty fired up when I brought it up to you uh, a bit ago. And I know you've done some research on your own. And I know we uh, we were pretty chatty in last week's episode. So I say we we jump right into this one if that's cool with you. Yeah, absolutely. What started this whole conversation was a Hanover research project that basically said that over the last six years, the average ACT score has decreased every year. So that just got you and I talking about test scores, what they actually mean, institutions throwing them out, some institutions bringing them back, which we'll get into. Uh, But yeah, I know you've got some things pulled up, but I, I guess quite obviously we can talk about how we started having test scores in the first place. We wanted to standardize measurement or that was the pitch, I guess, to standardize measurement, to level the playing field, although it did kind of the exact opposite. This is certainly not going to be a comprehensive uh, history of the test score. But yeah, it was originally an initiative to be sort of meritocratical, to give everyone a level playing field. And and so in that way, like kind of a valiant effort. But yeah, exactly. It, it accomplished the exact opposite. And there really aren't any other academic measures that are consistent enough. You can't compare GPAs at schools in different areas with people of different backgrounds. Like that's almost impossible to try to compare. So when you're looking at college admission, you need something to be able to distinguish a student from rural Virginia from somebody from Denver. Like you just need to be able to compare them academically and in theory and in The way people talked about it, that's what standardized tests were, but we're starting to move away from that. I, in my area, we took the ACT. Were you an SAT or ACT? I was an ACT kid as well. Yep. Yep. So I took that, I think twice um, at my local community college. (laughs) And you know, I, I know schools are requiring it less and less, but working with youth in my community, they're like seventh graders taking it now. Like it's continuing in, in high schools it continues to be a point of emphasis yeah and it's in it and at least at the high school level it has uh, affected so many other things as we've tried to standardize curriculum and standardize other tests that are at the high school level and not the college readiness test you know that the right. ACT and the SAT purport to be um, so yeah the, the entire movement of standardization and of trying to measure everyone at an equal playing field has sort of permeated K through 12. And yet it doesn't do that. And I think that's what some people are starting to, I I think we've known it for a while, but some people are starting to say out loud, right? Like test taking is its own skill. That is, you're not just measuring. If you give uh, Timothy and Jamie a science test, we're not just measuring how well we know science against each other. Maybe I'm better at memorizing random facts and you're better at working out formulas. Like our skills in science are so different and can't be measured on the same test. My skills are very limited. I think you would win that. But you're measuring test taking. And if there was a way to just measure the content, great, let's do that. But that's not at all what we're doing. And this puts demographics that are already at a disadvantage at a bigger disadvantage, right? Like you're going to post or we'll post a graphic uh, and talk about what you see in that particular graphic that jumped out to you. Yeah, one of the charts that we want to share this week is a chart from John Bakkenstead that he's actually posted a few years back, and it's from uh, 2018 data of the SAT. It's all data from the SAT. Uh, he did a bunch of downloads from their portal and assembled it into a database and, and brought it up in Tableau, basically looking at the income distribution of ACT scores, right? So ACT score by income distribution, and it is not subtle. 
the the higher income, the the more likely a particular person is to score higher on the ACT. And I think what that shows us is that, that this test can be gamed. And and I mean, even before these charts and the narrative surrounding the test, long before test optional, that sort of momentum and that idea was was coming forth. And we were seeing kids uh, invest, you know, hundreds of hours in prepping for the test. Um, going to courses and buying all sorts of books. And there was sort of a whole industry around just being prepared for this test. And your access into that industry directly correlated to your family's income. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think, Jamie, about about that correlation? And, and what does that say about the, the ability of the test to, to measure a person's inherent ability? I remember a Malcolm Gladwell quote, I think, from his book Outliers, just that when, when measuring academic success in a longitudinal study that was done, the only predictor of success was having books in your house. It wasn't how many hours your parents read to you. It wasn't the, uh, the number of times that you reread things or the amount of hours you studied. Having books in your home essentially was a symbol of what you're saying, that your family's in a place to go and purchase materials, to purchase preparation, to... Uh, to be focused on those kinds of things. Uh, a lot of families uh, that I went to college with a bunch of people at Berea College where it's it, only low-income students. Most of us didn't have a computer in our house. Most of us uh, did not have, we were working to contribute to the family and not that uh, middle-class individuals don't do that as well, but you're right. It is this idea that people are already set up for success in these exams more so than than other people. And that's just giving, perpetuating that cycle of giving people opportunities and then giving their kids opportunities and their kids opportunities. So it's right. generational. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we, we just can't claim that something is objective um, when you can buy your way into it. And that I think is, is the big takeaway in this chart that we'll share is I think making that case. Hey there, it's Jamie and Timothy from the EduData podcast, and we want to personally invite you to the Engage Summit this summer in Raleigh, North Carolina. The theme of the conference is AI Got You. We're not just talking theories. This conference is your guide to understanding and applying AI at your institution. By the end, you won't just get AI, you'll be ready to lead your campus through an AI transformation. It's for everyone who wants to use AI to level up everything you're doing. Whether your focus is to recruit or retain, the Summit offers a platform to learn, network, and bring back actionable insights to enhance your student engagement strategies. I hope you'll join us and some of our favorite Enrollify creators like Jamie Hunt, Dustin Ramsdell, and Artist Kadu in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th. Use the discount code Enrollify50 and you can register for just $99. You do not want to miss this, so join us at the Engage Summit this June. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. Can't wait to see you there. And so we've seen a lot of institutions go away from it, I think in part because fewer people started taking it, and I, this happened before the coronavirus pandemic, but also to try to get rid of that element of it to say, we're not going to look at who had the money to prepare for a test when we were assessing students. And I think that was growing in popularity, but it kind of leveled off. And now we're seeing it go back the other direction for some institutions. Did you think when schools stopped requiring it, that it would make a comeback? I certainly don't see why it should at this point. Um, I, I remember, you know, when it went away, this was not an issue that I was super aware of at the time. And so I didn't have a lot of thoughts of it at the time. But now, you know, having having tried to educate myself and tried to understand this issue in a more complex way. Yeah, it certainly does not make sense. And so maybe these institutions are seeing some data that they're just not sharing or haven't shared yet. And, and if they have such a case to make, uh, please do make it and yeah, make well it with data that supports your opinion. A lot of the Ivy League institutions are the ones bringing it back, and Dartmouth decided we need to defend this decision, and they did some studies, and it turns out that based on the data that they assessed for this, that SAT and ACT scores were predictive of academic success at Dartmouth. Now, I've seen data from other institutions, and that has not proven to be the case. 
They also say that the SAT is a strong predictor of academic success for all subgroups, which I also, I mean, this is their data. So maybe admission to Dartmouth is at such a level and, and maybe all these Ivy League schools that it's eliminating part of that financial barrier anyway. But Dartmouth has come forward and said, look at our data. This is why we're bringing test scores back. And they're not the only ones. A lot of other schools are doing that as well. Like you said, I expect other schools to put out reports. This was put out by the president of Dartmouth, as well as the dean of admissions, Lee Coffin. And this came out just January 30th, a few weeks ago. So this is a new report you can find on Dartmouth's website of them defending bringing back standardized test scores. I did not think that's something that would happen but just like everything else in higher ed, if a few people start doing it, I have a feeling that others are going to hop on board and say, well, if the Ivy League schools are doing it, we need to do it too, right? Like they, in a lot of ways, set, set the standard for schools that want to be elite academically. And I, I agree with you that that has been the trend in the past that, that folks have sort of looked to the Ivy Leagues for cues on on what to do and how to treat admissions. And I think that doing that, though, in this case, is the wrong move. You know, maybe maybe Dartmouth can make their case. I'm not going to be the one that that uh, analyzes that per se. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think that that's the right call for other institutions to bring that up. I think that institutions should be looking at their own students and looking at their own student population, specifically the types of students that they want to serve and uh, factoring in how the uh, how the test affects that and their, affects their ability to find those students and and provide uh, education to them. Um, uh, the An articulation of, of the test optional policy that I really appreciate comes from Akil Bello. Um, I found this on his LinkedIn page. He's a great follow if you're not following him. Uh, a test optional policy simply reduces the importance of testing and puts it on an equal footing with other optional elements in the application, like AP classes, like essays, like interviews, like extracurriculars, etc., donating to a building or claiming genetic affiliation with the institution. And I, I completely agree with that. I think that we should look at the test in that context as a student's ability to make the case for admission, but not make it the deciding factor. And so, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for your cue there, don't take it from Dartmouth. Try to find it internally and make the decision that makes sense for your institution. Right. I, I completely agree with you that it, it can be a piece of a puzzle depending on your demographic. Tests aren't going away, right? There's too much money in standardized testing for them to just say, eh, not worth it anymore. That's going to be a part of it. That's a part of some scholarship applications, even if your institution doesn't require that. So it's going to be out there. But we need to keep in mind what it is telling us about the applicants. Is it telling us they are good test takers? Is it telling us that they are actually great students? I also know... Uh, just anecdotally at a lot of schools that I've worked at, we would have people with perfect ACT scores that had a really hard time adjusting and didn't, weren't successful in college. So it needs to be, if you are going to require it, it needs to be giving, given appropriate weight in the admissions process. And we should not be taking our cues and just doing what other schools are doing. Kudos to Dartmouth for coming forward and, and presenting data to defend the decision. They're the first ones that I've seen to do that but I think you're right. I think every institution has to take a long, hard look at themselves, figure out who they want to serve, and if that should be a piece of the resume they look at for admissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really like what, um, what again, Akil sort of alludes to in, in that framing of the test optional policy, which is allowing the student to sort of shape their own narrative. Uh, allowing them to tell their own story and present what they want to present, um, I think is a really um, uh, interesting way to think about doing admissions uh, as opposed to trying to fit everyone through the square hole. So if you're an institutional leader, take a look at your data at your institution with your students and just see what falls out. Has test taking been a good indicator of anything or is it not really as important as the weight we've been putting on it for years? And how should that impact your decision on whether or not to require it? If you're an up and coming college student or the family of somebody about to go to college, take into account how you can present that as part of your package of part of your resume of if, if test scores are going to be a highlight, 
be ready to talk about why. If it's not a strength of yours, then uh, if you're applying to schools that require it, be prepared to talk about that because it is not going to go away, but we need to take it in context, I believe. And that's going to do it for today. Uh, this is another hot topic that I think will keep coming up again and again. I feel like some of these Ivy League schools have kind of broken the ice, and we're going to see a lot more about this coming forward. For Timothy Davis, I'm Jamie Boggs, and this has been the EduData Podcast. The EduData Podcast is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like the other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. We've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Jamie Hunt, Artis Kadu, Dustin Ramsdale, Jeremy Tears, and so many of your other favorite leaders in higher ed. And Rollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.